Civil death is a strange term to me. It suggests that an individual is dead to society. To me, it seems incredibly demeaning and unjust. Unfortunately, it is the reality of today's society that roughly 6 million Americans are denied the right to vote. I'm Evelyn Niggin, and I believe that in order to make lasting and effective change in today's society, we need to persist and act in a way that is worthy of the spirit of the suffrage movement. First, I'd like to briefly touch on some key aspects of the suffrage movement, then I'll talk a little bit about one of the obstacles that the suffragists faced, and finally, I'll explain how language was used as one of the main strategies by the suffragists. As we celebrate the centennial of women's suffrage, it is so important that we not only closely examine the 72 years that it took to win the vote, but also who ultimately benefited from the ratification of the 19th Amendment. It all began in 1848 when the first Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. In the following years, various states granted women the right to vote, Colorado being the first in 1896. Throughout the early 20th century, the women's suffrage campaign gained more and more traction, continuing to host parades, conventions, and lectures across the country. Finally, in 1919, the Federal Women's Suffrage Amendment that had originally been written by Susan B. Anthony in 1878 was passed. One thing to note about these events is that many of them were exclusionary and only permitted white women to attend and participate. The 19th Amendment granted some women, namely middle and upper class white women, the right to vote. While the amendment declared that voters could not be turned away on the basis of sex, it did not outlaw literacy tests and other exclusionary measures, continuing to support the idea of civil death. It wasn't until the mid-1960s that most of these exclusion tactics were eliminated, and yet still today, we find ourselves discussing free and fair elections. Much of the progress that has taken place over the past 172 years can be directly linked to instances of women entering the political sphere. This would explain why it has taken so long to get to where we are today in terms of voter rights. One of the largest obstacles that suffragists faced was gaining an audience with influential and government figures and earning political recognition. In Susan Ware's book, Why They Marched, she asks, How can someone demand the right to vote without having basic political rights to begin with? Suffragists knew that harnessing political influence was a very important factor in ultimately winning the right to vote. Although this knowledge was intuitive to the suffragists, it was not a simple task to accomplish while influential public and political figures were speaking out against the women's rights movement, labeling it as ludicrous and unnecessary. One of these notable figures was former President Grover Cleveland, who is on record saying that votes for women would upset the equilibrium of society so much that it would be a danger to society as a whole. Now, many of the obstacles that the suffragists faced, including this lack of political recognition, were not physical barriers. Anti-suffragists were using words to convince communities that the suffragist movement was a sham and that women were not fit for society, let alone politics. So, how did the suffragists respond? Well, they also used their words. There is something to be said about the power of words, particularly when language is coupled with emotion. Even today, we can see that suffragists were incredibly well-spoken, many of them still considered among the best public speakers in U.S. history. So the knowledge of language is apparent, but how does emotion evoke a stronger response to language? We have to believe that the suffragists had a fire within them. How else could they have maintained progress within the suffrage movement for over 72 years? This fire can be seen in all of the famous speeches given by iconic suffragists like Lucy Stone, and her speech, Disappointment is the Lot of Women, where the underlying sentiments are disappointment and hope, or, in Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman, which conveys sadness, anger, despair, and frustration. It was through speeches like these that women and men alike were won over by the suffrage movement, and not only as supporters, but active participants as well. Keep in mind that these speeches had as much of an impact on everyday citizens as political figures, and it was the combined pressure of local and government leaders um, that the vote was ultimately won. I implore you to remember this, both as November 3rd draws near and throughout your life in the times that you have the opportunity to use your voice. The 19th Amendment granted some women the right to vote, but the disproportionate impact of disenfranchisement across race and state creates inequalities yet today. Civil death is still very much a term that can describe millions of people across the country, but people like you can initiate change. Now, having heard some key components of the suffrage movement, learning about an obstacle that the suffragists faced, and discovering the kind of impact that language can have, I hope that you can see yourself as embodying the spirit of the suffragists as you engage in social justice in the future. Use your voice and your vote to help make lasting and effective change and make the suffragists proud.